Good morning. It is an absolute honor to be here with you today. Um, and I'm greatly appreciative of all my uh, fellow uh, recipients and, and folks in this room who are doing such amazing and important work. So today is a day of, as you know, of celebration and of mourning, a reminder that life and death are deeply connected and that what we do on this earth really matters. We're here today because Dr. Parker spent much of his life fighting for the rights of others, notably the poor and people of color. Recognizing the ability to get access to new technologies to communicate and learn isn't just a simply a privilege, but a right. He challenged people to ask hard questions and ignore the seemingly insurmountable nature of complex problems. In the process, he paved a road that enables an entire generation of activists, many of whom are in this room. I'm here today to talk about battles that are currently underway, about new internet-based technologies. I'm an ethnographer, which means I spend most of my time running around talking to people to map culture to understand the intersection between technology and society. It's easy to love or hate technology, to blame it for social ills, or to imagine it will fix what other people can't. But technology is made by people, in a society, and it tends to mirror and magnify the issues that affect everyday life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As mentioned, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania where I struggled to fit in. As a geeky queer kid, I rebelled against the hypocritical dynamics in my hometown. And when I first got online, before the World Wide Web existed, I was like a kid in a candy store. Through early online communities, I met people who opened my eyes to countless social issues, helped me appreciate things I didn't understand. Transgender activists who helped me understand gender, soldiers who helped me understand war, etc. Looking back, I often think about the internet as my saving grace, because the people that I met, the strangers that I met online, helped me take the path that I took today. I fell in love with the internet as a portal to complex, interconnected society that we live in. I went to college to study computer science because I wanted to build the systems that connect the people, to break down the societal barriers that I saw in front of me. And as my world got bigger, I started to realize that the internet was a platform, that what people did on that platform really ran the full spectrum. I watched activists use this technology to connect people in unprecedented ways. And I watched marketers use the same tools to manipulate people for capitalist gain. I stopped believing that technology could provide enlightenment just from its very existence. So in the late 1990s, the hype that sort of came around um, the internet became really bubblicious, and it was painfully clear that the economic agendas were really shaping the technology in powerful ways. After the dot-com bubble burst in 2000, I was part of a network of people determined to build a system that would allow people to connect, share, and communicate, like many of us had really gotten on the internet in the first place. By then I was a researcher trained by anthropologists, curious to know what people would do with the tools they called social media. And in the early days of the social network sites, it was exhilarating. We would meet in small rooms and talk about what could be done to really recreate a global network. And many of my utopian-minded friends had this great vision of how this structure could be used to tear down all sorts of cultural barriers. Yet as these tools became more popular and widespread, what unfolded was not a realization of the idyllic nature of many of the early de de developers but a complexity of practices that resembles the mess of everyday life. So I'm going to talk about youth for a second. I spent a decade talking to young people about how they use technology. And as social media was being embraced, I was driving around the country, talking with teens, trying to understand how this technology fit into their lives, and how they made sense of it, um, in, given what was going on around them. I also watched as privileged parents projected their anxieties onto the tools that made visible the lives of less privileged youth. And that was a lot of what drove, drove my activism as I started out. But I'm going to go with an example or a part of the story that I really struggled with. Not surprising to many people in the room, as social media exploded, our country's struggle with class and race got intertwined with technology. I'll never forget sitting down in a small town in Massachusetts in 2007 with a 15-year-old white girl I'll call Kat, talking about her life when she made a passing reference to why her friends all quickly abandoned MySpace and moved to Facebook, because it was safer and MySpace was boring. Whatever her look I gave her at that moment made her squirm. She looked down and said, it's not really racist, but I guess you could say that. I'm not really into racism, but I think my space is like more ghetto or whatever. I was taken aback and started probing to try to figure out what she was talking about to get a sense of her perspective. The people who use my space, again, not in a racist way, but they're usually more ghetto and hip hop lovers and yeah, that. As we continued talking, it became much more blunt. She told me that black people use my space and white people use Facebook. Fascinated by Kat's explanation and discomfort, I went back into my field notes. Sure enough, numerous teams made remarks that when read in light of Kat's story, I was clear that the social division that unfolded between the 2006 to 2007 school year. 
So I started asking teens about these issues. I started talking to them and I kept hearing more accounts of how race had narrated their use of these particular technologies. After I posted an analysis online, I got this response from a privileged white boy that I'll call Craig. The higher class uh, high school moved to Facebook. It was more cultured and less cheesy. The lower class were usually content to stick to MySpace. Any high school student who has a Facebook will tell you MySpace users are more likely to be barely educated and obnoxious. Like Pete's is more cultured than Starbucks, and Jazz is more cultured than Bubblegum Pop, and Max are more cultured than PCs. Facebook is of a cooler caliber than MySpace. Anastasia, from another white girl, who wrote back to me. She said, my school is divided into the honors kids. I think that's self-explanatory. The good, not so honors kids, the wanksters. They pretend to be tough and black, but when you live in a suburb in Westchester, you can't claim much hood. The Latinos and Hispanics, they tend to band together even though they could fit into any other group. And the emo kids, whose lives are always filled with woe. We were all in MySpace with our own little special networks, our own social networks, um, but when Facebook opened its door to high schoolers, guess who moved and guess who stayed behind? This was not the first time I had seen racial divisions. It kept coming out from all my work. I had mapped networks of teens in supposedly integrated schools where you could actually see the social divisions play out on all major forms of social media. And I witnessed and heard countless stories of the ways in which race was configuring everyday social dynamics as it was playing out into technology in the ways that it always had. In our supposedly post-racial society, social relations and dynamics were still configured by race. And today's youth they don't know how to talk about race. They don't know how to make sense of what they're seeing and what they're reproducing. So in the 2006 to 2007 school year, I watched an historic practice reproduce itself online. I saw a form of digital white flight. Like the city in the 1970s, MySpace got painted as a dangerous place filled with unsavory characters, while Facebook was portrayed as clean and respectable. And with money, media, and privileged users behind Facebook, it became the dominant player that attracted everybody. And racial divisions just shifted technology. Today, we can talk about Instagram and Vine. Teenagers weren't creating the racialized dynamics of social media. They were reproducing what they saw everywhere else and projecting it onto the tools. And they weren't alone. Journalists, parents, politicians, and pundits gave them the racist language that they reiterated. And today's technology is valued culturally and financially based on how much it is used by the most privileged members of our society. So let's shift focus for a second. Thirteen years ago, when a group of us were sitting around a table trying to imagine how to build social media that would support rich social dynamics, none of us could imagine where we are now. Sure, there were plenty who wanted to be rich and famous, but no one thought that a social network would be uh, used by over a billion people and valued, valued in the hundreds of billions of dollars? That was insane. No one thought that every major company would have a social media strategy or that um, the architecture uh, of these technologies would reconfigure the public and cultural landscape. None of us were focused on what would become big data. Big data is a fuzzy, amorphous concept referencing a set of technologies and practices for analyzing large amounts of data. These days, though, it's primarily a phenomenon, promising that if we have more data, we can just solve all the world's problems. Of course, the problem with big data isn't whether or not we have the data, but whether or not we have the ability to make sense of it, to make meaning, to produce valuable insights with that data. And this is often trickier than one might imagine. One of the perennial problems with statistical and machine learning techniques is that they underpin um, big data analytics by relying on the data that is entered as input. And when the input is biased, what you get out is biased. These systems learn the biases in our society, and they spit them back out at us. Consider the work done by Latanya Sweeney, a brilliant computer scientist. One day, she was searching for herself on Google when she noticed that the ads displayed were for companies offering criminal record background checks with titles like Latanya Sweeney arrested, um, thereby implying that she may indeed have a criminal record. So, so suspicious, she started searching for other, more white-sounding names, only to find that the advertisements offered in association with those names were quite different. She set about to more formally test the system and find that indeed, searching for black names was much more likely to produce ads for criminal justice products and services. The story attracted a lot of media attention, but what the public failed to understand was that Google wasn't intentionally discriminating or selling ads based on race. Google was unaware of the content of the ad. They were unaware of the people looking at the ad. All they knew is that certain people with certain templates and fingerprints clicked on ads for some things and some other people didn't. They didn't know the details. But because racist viewers were more likely to click on those ads when searching for black names, Google's algorithm quickly learned to serve up the ads for names that are understood as black. In other words, Google was trained to be racist by its very racist users. Our cultural prejudice 
sets are deeply embedded into countless data sets, the very data sets that our systems are trained to learn on. Students of color are much more likely to have disciplinary school records than white students. Black men are far more likely to be stopped and frisked, arrested of drug possession, or charged with felonies even when their white counterparts engage in the same behaviors. Poor people are far more likely to have health problems, live further away from work, struggle to make rent. Yet all of these data are used to fuel personalized learning algorithms, risk assessment tools for judicial decision making, credit and insurance scores. And so the system predicts that people who are already marginalized are higher risks, thereby constraining their opportunities and their options, making sure that they indeed become higher risks. This was not what my peers set out to create when we imagined building tools that allowed you to map who you knew or enable you to display your interests and tastes. We didn't architect for prejudice, but we didn't design systems to combat it either. Lest you think that I fear and despise big data, let me take a moment to highlight the potential. I'm on the board of Crisis Text Line, a phenomenal service that allows youth in crisis to communicate with counselors via text message. We've handled millions of conversations with youth who are struggling with depression, disordered eating, suicidal ideation, and sexuality confusion. The practice of counseling is not new. We've had hotlines for a long time. But the potential shifts dramatically when you have millions of messages that you can train a system in order to help people. Natural language processing allows us to automatically bring up resources that might help a counselor or to encourage a counselor to pass the conversation to a different counselor. Because of analytics, we're encouraged to take specific paths that actually help make certain that we can help texters as best as possible. In other words, we're using data to empower counselors to help youth who desperately need our help. And we've done more active rescues during suicide attempts than I'd like to count. So many youth lack access to basic mental health services, and technology gives us the power to actually make that process better, more efficient, and more effective in an environment where we have so little funding to support it. But the techniques that we use at Crisis Text Line are the exact same techniques that are used in marketing, or personalized learning, or predictive policing. Let's look at the latter for a second. Predictive policing involves taking prior information about police encounters and using that to make a statistical assessment about the likelihood of crime happening in a particular place or of a particular person. That's exactly what we see in Crisis Text Line. But in a controversial move, Chicago used these analytics to make a list of people most likely to be a victim of violence. What they did in order to prevent crime was they sent police out and approached them, telling them that they indeed were most likely to die in the next 12 months. Talk about really creepy, right? Surveillance by powerful actors doesn't build trust, it erodes it. Imagine if the same information was instead given to a social worker, or better to a community liaison. Sometimes it's not the data that's disturbing, but how it's used, and by whom. Knowing how to use data isn't easy. One of my colleagues at Microsoft Research, Eric Horvitz, can predict with startling accuracy whether or not somebody will be hospitalized based on what they search for. But what do you do with that information? Reach out to people? That's Word. Do nothing? Is that even ethical? No matter how good our predictions are, figuring out how to use them in a complex social and cultural landscape isn't something that technology can solve for us. We need to solve that. In fact, as it stands, technology is just making it harder for us to have reasonable conversations about agency and dignity, responsibility and ethics. Data is power. And increasingly, we're seeing data being used to assert power over people. It doesn't have to be this way, but one of the things that I've learned is that unchecked, new tools are almost always empowering the privilege at the expense of those who are not. Dr. Parker understood that. He understood that if we wanted less privileged people to be informed and empowered, they needed access to the same types of quality information and communication technologies as those who were privileged. Today, we're standing on a new precipice. For most media act activists, unfettered internet access is the center of conversation, and that is critically important. But I would like to challenge you today to think a few steps ahead of the current fight. We are moving into a world of prediction, a world where more people are going to be able to make judgments about others based on data. Data analysis that can mark the value of people as worthy workers, parents, borrowers, learners, and citizens. Data analysis has been underway for decades, but is increasingly salient in decision making um, uh, across numerous sectors. Data analysis that most people don't understand, even if they're subjected to it. Many activists will be looking to fight the ecosystem of prediction, regulate when and where it can be used. That's fine and well when we're talking about how these technologies are designed to do harm. But more often than not, these tools will be designed to be helpful, to increase efficiency, to identify people who need help. And they will be used for good alongside the same practices that will be terrifying. So how do we learn to use this information 
information to empower? How do we create the right context that good can be done with it? One of the most obvious issues is the diversity of people who are building and using these tools to imagine our future. It's extraordinarily narrow right now. Statistical and technical literacy isn't even part of the curriculum in most American schools. In our society where technology jobs are high paying and technical literacy is needed for citizenry, less than 5% of high schools even offer AP computer science courses. Needless to say, black and brown youth in this country are much less likely to have access, let alone opportunities. If people don't understand these systems and what they're doing, how do we expect them to challenge them? We must learn how to uh, ask hard questions of technology and those making decisions based on our analysis. It wasn't long ago when financial systems were total black boxes and we fought for fiduciary accountability to combat corruption and abuse. Transparency of data, algorithms, and technology isn't going to be enough. We need to make certain assessment is built into any system that we roll out. You just can't just put millions of dollars worth of surveillance equipment into the hands of the police, hoping that you will magically produce accountability. Yet with police more body cameras, that's exactly what we're doing. And we're not even trying to assess the implications because we're too excited about the technology. This is probably the fastest rollout of the technology out of hope, but it won't be the last. So how do we get people to look beyond hope and fear and actively interrogate the trade-offs of rolling out any system into our society? More and more technology is going to play a central role in every sector, every community, and every interaction. It's easy to screech in fear or dream of a world in which problems magically get solved through technology. But to actually make the world a better place, we need to start paying attention to the different tools that are emerging and to learn to ask hard questions about how they can be used to improve the lives of everyday people. Now, more than ever, we need those who are thinking about social justice to understand technology, and those who understand technology to commit to understanding social justice. Thank you.